Hi everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Mm. I am Evelyn Lam. I am a security architect at Morgan Stanley, and thank Max, you know, for introducing me, my background. So I'm very delighted today to share my views in, uh, you know, authentication space about the challenges in the cloud transformation journey. Now more than ever, um, enterprise company are using cloud application at an increasing pace. Work from home is the new normal. I am doing the presentation from home right now. And this trend is not going away after the pandemic ends. We all know that, right? According to a survey uh, conducted by Sedata, before the pandemic, already 17% of US employees work from home at least five days per week. And that increased to 44% during the pandemic. And 25% of the uh, respondents of the survey would like to continue to work from home after the pandemic. So this work from home phenomenon has made the whole cloud transformation even more demanding than before. But thankfully, many organizations had started to shift their technology uh, from on-premises to cloud before the pandemic. So in the last five years, we have seen enterprise relying more and more on you know, the business critical SaaS application, something you know like uh, Google G Suite, Morgan, oh, sorry, um, Office 365, and Salesforce, right? And the collaboration tools shown that we are using right now and Google Meet even becoming more uh, crucial today to empower organizations and also uh, non-profit organization or enterprise to survive this pandemic and embrace them to the future uh, world of remote working. Um, and meanwhile, there are also some enterprise that have already started to deploy their in-house application on the public cloud service provider. So um, as all we know, there are the platform like AWS, um, Amazon Web Service, and also Microsoft Azure, uh, uh, the, the big player in that area. Um, so what made them think differently to accelerate the cloud adoption? Firstly, I do think the software as a service, the access model enable the employee device to connect to not only from the company corporate network in the past, but also they can use their own device to connect, to go to use the uh, firm application from the personal device from internet is an excellent access model for work from home. And secondly, with you know the cloud technologies becoming more and more mature every day, um, the desire to leverage the cost and feasibility benefits of cloud has always the concern about you know loss of control, data uh, stability, and we can see some more conservative and highly regulated business like the financial industry. Um, you know, I, I work in the financial industry the healthcare sector are increasingly adopting, you know, the public health service. But talking about the cloud security, right, even though many, many companies adopted the SaaS solution, more are still earlier in the game or recently started the mm. cloud transformation journey. So now the question is, does a workable SaaS integration mean a secure SaaS integration? It is not, right? So, and how many enterprises really have a strategic solution to, you know, enable the cybersecurity culture to maintain the security standards sustainably is still in question. And we have a lot more to learn and explore. I just want to say it's very important to note that the security vulnerabilities of the cloud usually are not about the vulnerability of the uh, cloud service provider and wow, or work storage. But I would say the real threats and gaps in cloud security are about what is being put in the cloud and how the cloud environment is configured and managed by the consumer. So, I mean, the cloud consumer usually I refer to the IT organization or the security department 
of the consumer in the company. So, and they are fully responsible for managing native cloud mm -hmm. services and infrastructure securely. Indeed, enforcing security practice in a company could be a really tough job. And I know that. <laughs> so to be effective, the message needs to be from top down. So make sure the company executive on board with the cybersecurity values, including giving the funding to the security project, including funding the security awareness training to build a security culture among the employee is so important, which means that when there is a very critical architecture decision to be made to enable cloud, then the security requirement must not be viewed as a barrier, but instead the essential elements to support the business. So, and therefore in this presentation, I will go through some common SaaS integration security pitfalls, the risk of unmanaged cloud identity and explain why adopting an identity for what we call it IDP um, could solve a lot of authentication problem smarter uh, you know, than the traditional way on-prem. So now let me move to the next slide. Challenges. Let's look at the difference between a conventional on-prem environment versus the cloud environment. On-prem, I look at it like a road garden where business activities was conducted within the office or the network boundaries mm -hmm. monitored and guarded by explicit firewall policy. So when the application of the company are hosted on the internal network and only accessible from a corporate device, then the security team may think, you know, the device is legitimate. And therefore, only a single factor authentication, sometimes just username and password, is good enough to authenticate a, uh, to a high-risk application, you know, to do the trade, to handle some payroll information of the employee, very sensitive information. But in contrast, the public cloud reside in a more open and shared environment. So the environment is accessible to basically any user in the world with any endpoint from any location and any device, right? So that is very different in terms of the attack vectors and the vulnerabilities. And that's why we need strong authentication. Uh, it's so critical to protect, you know, the SaaS application endpoint and also the public cloud environment. So one of the most common authentication design failure is when a staff in a company needs to log on to a SaaS application, but single sign-on is not used. Um, without single sign-on, each application in the SaaS has its own identity store and also its own login URL and also password requirement. As the average user, if they have to manually maintain multiple accounts, multiple passwords, they start to be so frustrated. And what they do, they reuse the password across the SaaS application. And even worse, they just reuse the same password of their corporate account and just set it as the password of the SaaS. And this type of issue is exactly what, you know, cyber criminal, they are looking, uh, you know, to exploit. And reusing password basically um, you know, cause a wider spread of vulnerability of a single isolated data breach to be gateways mm -hmm. for an attacker to get a profile access to process application and even some on-prem element. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, as Max mentioned, um, I have years of experience in cybersecurity and also conducting the security assessment of the SaaS integration. And what of the most important rules is to avoid, you know, the corporate staff to save their work-related password to the external party. Um, in many cases, we really have no control over where and how this password sending externally are stored by the vendors and who at the vendor organization has access to your password because there's no guarantee that all SaaS vendor or any other external party have a security team that ensure the password are encrypted in transit, 
and hash property in storage. And well, luckily, in almost all the case I have seen, the actual password is definitely stored in plain text. So that's great. But it's also not uncommon to see people are using outdated hashing algorithm like MD5 uh, that has to be going away for so many years and also SHA-1 to hash the password where uh, when they store the password in the database or you know LDAP whatever and even some of them use a more secure hashing algorithm like SHA-2 not all of them use SORT and that you know you know SORT is really a mechanism to easily resist the push force attack and here for example in my company is treated as a mandatory requirement to protect the password in storage so now um, what makes it even worse is that the access to the database storing the hashed password is wide open to mm. for example the database administrator in the company which means that whoever has the access to the database could use a rainbow table to reverse the hash password into the original password. Well, if they are smart enough to do that. Um, and I have also seen some SaaS vendor, they do encrypt the password. Sometimes you need to encrypt the password for future use instead of hashing them. So, um, but, and they did that in the application level. That's great. But what happened is that the encryption key itself is poorly managed. The encryption key is just saved in a subfolder of the encrypted data instead of using a really tamper-proof, you know, a commercial grade key vault, right? So in that case, if you have the encrypted data in this folder and the encryption key in the subfolder, I feel like it's like you have a $10 million house, but you just put your home key in the mailbox next to the door. So that, that's really bad. Um, in the news headline, we have seen data breaches in different companies. So when your corporate employee password finally, because of different kind of data breaches, end up in the dark web. So and if they also happen to reuse the you know the same password as that of the corporate account, then the cyber criminal can use this compromised password to attack the company accounts uh, using a technique, for example, called um, uh, credential stuffing, etc. So, and therefore to avoid the risk of password leakage, or SaaS application in the firm should use a single sign-on solution, which is linked to a centralized directory with the federation technology. And I'm going to talk you know, about the solution in the next couple of slides. Um, I haven't said that in the reality, not all SAS support single sign-on. And now it comes to the question that will your company refuse to sign a contract with a SAS vendor that does not fulfill the security requirement? It depends, right? It really depends uh, about the company cybersecurity culture. In some company that has the weaker cybersecurity culture, the choice of using the vendor application is more likely to be driven by the business need than you know the security compliancy. Okay, so I talk about the first challenge. I would like to talk about the second challenge. Failing to adopt a single sign-on solution in cloud integration caused another pressing problem, uh, the rapid creation of cloud mm. identity in multiple SaaS and cloud service provider platforms. So um, in general, when an organization adopt more and more cloud services, more cloud identity will need to be created and decommissioned. However, interestingly, um, it's also not uncommon to see for many companies, the SaaS account were created and managed um, you know, at the department level by the administrator in a specific department instead of having an IT system, which is linked to the HR system to control all the corporate account. And not many companies, well, I mean, at least not all companies have a centralized inventory for the SaaS subscription. And therefore, they have no idea about what employee accounts were in the SaaS application and failed to delete them when somebody left the firm. So a typical pitfall 
for the poor identity lifecycle management is Shombi's SaaS account. When an employee leaves, most companies manage to delete the local account for the former employee. Still, many fail to ensure that the former employee SaaS application accounts are deleted or you know, at least the assets has to be revoked, right? So somebody already left the firm should not be able to log on to a SaaS application and continue to see the firm information. But that's not so obviously easily to be done. Um, and the most dangerous zombie account, I would say are those with high privilege, which attacker can use uh, you know, to, to get access to some corporate secret, to uh, uh, get access to uh, the encryption key of some very critical data, or even to turn off some cr uh, critical infrastructure like you know firewall, <laughs> something like that, or router. In short, we don't want unused, unattended accounts hanging around in the environment because that gives more targets for attacker to go after. So managing user account provisioning and depositioning uh, in the cloud environment and SaaS require us to use a centralized identity management system, just like the way we handle the local account on brain. And to audit the account creation, when developers deploy application on a cloud service provider platform, it would be really smart to use a cloud native or third party tools to regularly pull the list of users and also group their role, the permission from the cloud environment, right? So, um, there are some tools like the PowerShell in Microsoft Azure, the AWS Kamana interface that are all good tools that the IT administrator or security administrator can reconcile the user data to a centralized um, IBM system in, uh, you know, for the access management and governance purpose. Now talking about the solution, in the last couple of slides, I explained the problem of not using a single sign-on solution and the risk of sending credential externally. So, so what is exactly an IDP um, for the single sign-on solution? An IDP, identity provider, is a service that store and verifies user identity. IDP can be on-prem, can be in cloud, and they often work with the single sign-on providers to authenticate user. With an IDP, now user no longer need to specify the credential uh, when they do, you know, um, the SaaS mm -hmm. login or cloud platform login. It's not only dramatically improve the overall user experience and provide secure and um, an interrupt the service by keeping one credential that will never need to be sent to you know, the external party. And other benefit of using a commercial identity provider, IDP, is to keep the company aligned with the industry standard. So um, I observed that company that have a long history, like <laughs> more than 100 years of history, for example, they have so many legacy applications, even some still running, you know, mainframe application. And some legacy application builds generations ago that handle, you know, the authentication, username and password themselves within the application using some homegrown authentication methodology. That really so far away from the latest industry standard. But adopting a commercial IDP would enable the company to embrace the new standard. Um, for example, the authentication protocol like OpenID Connect, um, OAuth, and also SAML, right? These are the um, latest common computer language that can enable people seamlessly integrate with different SaaS and CSP. And this kind of standardization is also reducing the vulnerability in the overall IT environment. Um, let me use the, you know, we use the password hashing algorithm example in the last slide, right? Um, I just mentioned that some people, they use a SHA-1 to hash the password. And SHA-1 used to be safe long time ago until 
one day somebody successfully crack the algorithm, I'll be able to reverse engineer to, uh, to get back the plain text password. So instead of having the IT team to upgrade the Cypher uh, library um, from you know, SHA-1 to SHA-2, then if that storage, whatever is already inside the IDP, the IDP will take care of the library upgrade for their customer. And these details really help company to minimize the overall IT environment vulnerability uh, you know, uh, quicker and also help them to meet the compliance and regulatory requirements smoothly. So for example, I work in a bank and uh, we always need to make sure we meet um, well, we, we, we met actually the uh, regulatory requirement every time. So, and sometimes proofing to them, we use a commercial grade product that already in compliance that really help our conversation. And now, so what is a good IDP solution? Um, I'm going to talk about something like the cloud-based IDP solution in this next slide. But in general, it's really essential to choose a good IDP solution that enable the security team to standardize the single sign-on connection to cloud application, to SaaS, also to the on-prem application in a centralized policy framework. So everything will be centralizedly monitored and the policy can be enforced um, you know, um, systematically. So now, um, last but not least, I would like to talk about the cloud IDP. And um, I would like to see how we can tackle this kind of cloud authentication problem more intelligently using a cloud-based IDP solution. The most commonly used cloud-based IDP solution, I think now today, we have heard about the Azure Active Directory and also the Google Identity as a Service. So um, how is a cloud-based IDP different from an on-prem IDP? Cloud IDP is a cloud federation broker as a gateway or a proxy server that all federation requests should go through. So it contains one or more trust on to an on-prem IDP or a trust business partner IDP. In that case, the user authenticate with their local credential and then trust each federated um, application, including both on-prem and cloud host application. And um, a good cloud-based IDP usually has the features that I really love, is to enable the administrative user to create policy that continuously assess, you know, assess the risk and enforce the policy to mitigate the risk whenever they arrive in a uh, authentication session. And that's called risk-based authentication. Um, something even smarter than just multi-factor authentication. And to explain what is risk-based authentication, let me just try to tell a story, right? Imagine now, late at light, somebody just unexpectedly knock your door. At first, um, you may be hesitate to open the door. Who, who is coming to visit me, you know, late at night. But then your friend calls you um, from outside, you pick up the call, you recognize your friend's voice, you saw her face from a picture or the WhatsApp message, then you have confidence that, okay, the person outside is your friend. So you decided to open the door and let her in. So basically, respect of an occasion solution works in much the same way. It used real-time intelligence to get a holistic view of the context behind each login dynamically. So when a user attempts to log in with a device or from a geolocation unknown to the system, then the system will not allow the access until the user has presented additional evidence like authentication factor to proceed. And then go back to the previous, you know, uh, locking door story. What if someone looks and sounds really like your friend and try to break into your home? So in the computer world, 
thanks to machine learning, the computer knows your friend better than you do. So um, there is something called keystroke dynamic. It's a class of behavioral biometric that capture the typing style of a user. So typing style, uh, such as the factor of how long usually you type your username and password, how long you depress a key, and how long you know you take um, take you to type the specific key, for example. And personal keystroke are difficult to be made, and therefore can be used as a form of biometric. You know, apart from your fingerprint, apart from your iris scan, whatever. And um, because this kind of keystroke analysis is running at the background. So therefore, unlike the traditional multi-factor authentication that the system keep calling you for more more factor and information, uh, the keystroke dynamic has no impact to the user experience. And going back again to the story, what about your friend outside is compromised? So even though the person outside sounds familiar and looks familiar, you probably start to feel suspicious because your friend call you from a number in another country, right? In a risk-based authentication, the system detects the malicious IP address and also suspicious travel. For example, suppose you sign in from Montreal three hours ago to an application, and since it's not possible to make the, um, I mean, oh, sorry. And then the server saw that there is an other login attempt from the IP address in Russia because it's not possible to travel from uh, Montreal to Russia in three hours, right? Uh, in that case, the risk-based IDP shall deny your access until you provide extra factor to verify your identity. So for the risk-based IDP, because the sensor of the risk already is, exists in the whole identity platform, right? Uh, throughout the authentication, they can easily be added as the behavioral biometric to uh, integrate with the policy. And a risk-based IDP can also be configured to analyze the risk not only at the time you log in, but also throughout the whole authentication uh, session. Um, for example, imagine today uh, you sign in um, you know, to a corporate application from a laptop, and then you are connecting to the Wi-Fi in the office. And you decide to just pack your laptop to go to the cafe downstairs to drink a coffee and continue to work from the cafe. But because you are using the public Wi-Fi in the cafe, your security department has concerned that you use an unencrypted Wi-Fi connection to process your company data. So they could have already configured the policy in the cloud IDP to block your access. Um, because the IDP detected you have a IP address change. And even, you know, they brought you, even you are already authenticated, your session is still valid and you are connected from the same device. So the configuration of the policy is quite flexible depending on the security um, requirement from the IT department. And this smart and dynamic risk analysis would help user and security administrators to solve the problem about the future anywhere, anytime, from any device, accessing the cloud services and also the SaaS um, more intelligently. So um, to summarize, managing identity and access in cloud is, is complex, more complicated than the traditional on-prem environment, which we've already got them by explicit firewall policy and a lot of monitoring are going on. But thanks to the latest um, security technologies in cloud, we can solve the problem, you know, the more complex problem, more intelligently. And organization, particularly for those more, you know, using more than one service provider um, in cloud and also multiple SaaS, should develop a strategic roadmap by adopting an identity provider solution to enable a secure and sustainable and scalable cloud transformation journey. Um, that's the end of uh, my talk.